Um, I have the pleasure of introducing to you uh, Teresa Jacobs, uh, who is currently the Executive Director of the International Skills Development Corporation. And she divides her time between London in the UK and South India to develop and promote partnerships. And in her spare time, I doubt that she's got much spare time, but she does do teacher training for teachers of English as a foreign language. And I'm sure she'll be giving us even some more information uh, when she starts speaking. I would like to welcome everybody who's here. And if you come in a little bit later, please feel welcome. Um, there is a Q&A forum. If you have questions for Teresa, please write them down there. Uh, we can also use the chat room, but it's more for the social part of our interactions. Um, Teresa, it's now my pleasure and my honor to hand over to you. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for the um, lovely introduction and um, um, greetings to um, one and all. It's an absolute pleasure to be joining you here today in, um, in, in um, from rather gloomy, overcast, grey sky, rainy, drizzly London. And I'm sure all of you will understand that um, I'm only slightly disappointed that I'm not there with you in beautiful sunny Durban today. But, um, you know, needs must. And um, at least we can be thankful for um, technology that is bringing us together today. So uh, my subject is um, ditching the answer books, the rubber bands, the treasury tags and the paper clips. And I deliberately gave you sort of uh, a bit of a quirky title just because I thought it might get you back from um, lunch a little quicker. So actually the subtitle is a bit more mainstream, benefits and barriers to the adoption of e-assessment. So um, as uh, beautifully introduced by Karen, um, I'm an elected member of the e-assessment association. Um, we are in a um, volunteer body um, who generally work to, to um, promote um, digital assessment, both formative and summative um, internationally, um, and particularly to, to, um, to, to, to look to influence um, resistance within government bodies. I'm also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Educational Assessments, and um, I do a lot of my work in India, um, but I've previously held senior management positions with professional um, and, and um, off-call regulated organizations and within private HE establishments. And of course, like many of you, ultimately um, from the bottom of my heart, um, I'm like many of you, um, I'm still a teacher. So, um, that's a brief introduction to me. Um, my main interests are all things assessment, from the construction to the delivery, to the standardization and results. And throughout my career, I have been so fortunate to actually um, have as my CPD. Can you imagine just how wonderful it is to have as your CPD um, the privilege to be reviewing questions, question banks in subjects with such variety as accounting and finance, nutrition, modern history, job seeking. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you can learn very, very much by going to the answers to the, to the questions. You know, I don't study, I just read the answers. Um, sadly, our students do not get that privilege. Um, and um, unusually, where some of us play chess um, or do knitting and crossword puzzles in their spare time, I actually edit multiple choice questions. You know, that is actually my hobby because from the start, um, I come from a language background. And I have that just, I just love that attention to detail that comes with multiple choice questions which does mean that in social settings, I have taken as a compliment when colleagues have said, do you know, it is amazing. Teresa is so good at writing rubbish. 
Now, when I say I'm so good at writing rubbish, of course, that is the distractors, the wrong answers to multiple choice questions. So um, I can be proud of being the expert at writing rubbish. And just to be very clear um, with esteemed um, participants here, I'm not a researcher, but rather a lifetime learner and gatherer of experiences, some of which I would like to share with you today. So um, I'm going to talk about typical exams now and before. And I think what you might be noticing from the two pictures is nothing much has particularly changed um, from um, in hundreds of years. The basics of um, people gathering in examination rooms, sitting at more or less wobbly des desks with different kinds of pens and anxiously scribbling for 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, three hours, um, hasn't really changed, not only in decades, but in hundreds of years. So um, that's my starting point. And we have, of course, all the um, paraphernalia that now goes with um, the paper-based exam. And for those of you enjoy, who enjoy that world, you know, the rubber bands that we use, those treasury tags that we use to join the extra pieces of paper. Um, we might have moved away from the blobby old inkwell and the, you know, loose ink, um, but we've only moved into the domain of the students taking all the bits and pieces into the exam, you know, the pencil sharpeners, the erasers, the little, the little solar powered calculators and all that, you know, really nothing much changing in years and years and years. So I'm going to tell you a short story from not so long ago. So I would like you to be sitting comfortably for my short story that, of course, inevitably starts with once upon a time. Once upon a time, um, I was in a new job and I was listening carefully as I was um, hearing the explanation of exactly what processes needed to be followed um, as I managed these paper-based exams for um, a, an extremely high-ranking, very, very professional awarding body who were dealing with company directors. So not 18, 19-year-old students, not 11, 12-year-old children, but the directors and members of the boards of um, leading companies. And this was an entirely paper-based exam. And as I listened, um, I began to look a bit like the lady in the cartoon with my mouth gently opening a little more, a little more, and a little more. And the questions buzzing through my head with these paper-based exams. You are offering really restricted exam windows. But of course, you have courses relating to these exams, which is your income, every month. But no, the exam can only be twice a year. Well, of course, that's because we have to hire the exam rooms and the wobbly desks and all the invigilators. So I first of all felt we had excessive incon you know, inconvenience there. We then had the simplicity on one hand of a multiple choice question paper um, and the other slightly more complex case study exam with upwards of four months being acceptable for um, delivery of results. Added the extra challenge, there was a lady in my team and one happy day she came over, big smile on her face. And she said, oh, 
It's taken me two days to do this, but I finally managed to find the center that will host our examination in Guatemala City. Oh, well, that's wonderful. How many candidates do we have in Guatemala City? Oh, just one. So, you know, thinking more sort of on the commercial side, one member of my team had spent two days trying to find a centre for one single candidate where our precious exam paper would go to, we don't really know who, except the friendly centre that agreed for a few pesos, pounds, whatever it be, to actually host our exam. So, problem solved, but actually I couldn't help thinking we solved the wrong problem. And then we looked at the huge amounts of money that we were spending on DHL, I love them to bits, but you know, um, hotel conference facilities, and of course, um, recycling facilities, because we generated an awful lot of paper, and all of this paper, of course, eventually ends up as, um, as tomorrow's recycled paper. So a um, lot of imperatives. So, uh, but the most startling thing for me, actually, um, dear listeners, was a note from a customer. You know, we all want to look at customer feedback. And this customer had just taken the case study exam. He was a fairly you know, high ranking director of a board and someone that certainly you would want to listen to. And he said, never again. Your three-hour written exam is torture. It's the most I've written since I left school. The most I've ever written since I left school is a shopping list. But actually, these days, I do my shopping list on my iPad. So, you know, what is this about? So I began thinking, as the new person with this job, my, my new job is to manage examinations, not torture. You know, I'm not in the business of torture, not in the business of selling torture. So how about I think about doing things very, very differently? So, of course, naturally, the way forward was to move to computer based assessment. In this case, as you see the image of computer based assessment in an examination room. But ultimately, um, the attraction was um, to move to remote invigilation. And um, I am fairly proud to say that um, with uh, a lot of gentle persuasion and some less gentle persuasion and a lot of enthusiasm, we eventually were, as that professional body, the first professional body in the UK to move to 100% remote invigilation in around about 15 months. So quite a phenomenal change um, and you know quite a lot going on um, in the background. Now to be absolutely clear um, dear listeners this of course was in a professional um, some, uh, a professional setting not a school setting. Um, it was a high stakes exam and it was actually a correspondingly relatively high cost exam. Um, but, of course, there were many, many barriers to go from point A to point B. Some real, some perceived. You get the what if. Oh, what are we going to do if, if, if the Wi-Fi doesn't connect? What are we going to do if the Zoom link doesn't work? And then we had, well, why are you fixing it? Because it's not broken. Well, I have the answer there, um, because it's torture. Um, is it normal? Is anybody else doing this? Well, yes, quite a lot of people are doing this. I didn't tell them that actually nobody was doing remote invigilation. And when they noticed that, we actually had this marvellous opportunity to advertise ourselves as the early adopters, which is actually what that institute needed. And then the more practical um, what ifs of can I type as fast as I write? What about firewalls? You know, when I use my own laptop, is it going to cost more? 
And how are we going to make this work all over the world? Because I will say I was working in an, on an international context across lots and lots of different time zones and needed scalability, but also needed accessibility where we would never say no to a candidate in Guatemala who wished to do our examination. But of course, our examination um, being held at a single center that took us two days to locate um, was not a message for scalability on paper. So um, the options to start with were really a bit of a hybrid, a bit of a salad, a bit of a pick and mix of while we began to move, you know, as the journey went on, we actually took a multi-pathway before we ended up with where we wanted to be. And um, if anybody cares to ask me later, would I do it that way again? The answer is categorically no. I would go for big bang. But so for a few months, we had the take it remotely, or travel to an exam centre. Take it on paper or take it on computer. But if you take it on paper, obviously you have to travel to an exam centre. And if you're in Zimbabwe and the nearest exam centre is in South Africa, that might be the best we can do. But the other golden one was, of course, that because we ditched the paper, if you would like to take your exam two weeks after your training course, you can do it on computer. But if not, and you want to do it on paper, well, you may have to wait five to six months. So there were many forces moving us towards um, the single journey, which was ultimately 100% computer based, 100% remote invigilation, no more examination halls, and the ability to have multiple test sessions with the multiple choice session. We indeed went to every month except August, um, and being able to give the results within two weeks, not four months. So um, who to convert? Well, converting the stakeholders, you always need to go to the finance people. Ultimately, um, listeners, it is cheaper. It's not instantly cheaper, but it can be the scalability. It's ultimately cheaper. Now, from a quality assurance perspective, it is amazing that um, you, you gather data, and I don't want to make this sound simplistic, and I could get too enthusiastic about the data, but you gather data on exactly how long people are taking to manage a question, which questions they're coming back to, what happens when they change their answers, um, what order they're managing questions in, plus the amazing data just on how easy it is to see why so many people are choosing C as the wrong answer, and maybe it's not wrong enough. So um, that was really um, something that was, was uh, extremely powerful. And you know, if you're still on paper, you won't know what you're missing, but when you've got it, you sort of realize, you know, it's a bit like me. I grew up without an iPhone, obviously. Um, grew up without an iPhone, but um, you know, I could not be without it now. Um, in terms of the security, well, um, we went for a one to six remote invigilation, one remote invigilator for six candidates, which of course absolutely beats hands down the, um, the, the, the level of, of, um, of uh, observation of your um, human invigilators who regrettably don't have eyes in the backs of their heads um, on security and on perception of security. Um, in terms of public relations, well, needless to say, we came across looking very modern and very forward looking, um, where the previous perception had been a bit old fashioned and a bit traditional. And um, I'm proud to say, you know, that um, I, I, I did my little bit for, um, uh, for, for um, the for environmental impact. Um, okay, 
um, a few thousand examination papers being shredded many, many times, you know, all over the world isn't massive. But look, we all know we have to do our bits. So pitfalls and solutions. Well, yes. Did I have any? Oh, yes, I did. Imagine my horror when four or five centres all ended up cut, being cut off from the exam five minutes before. Honestly, listeners, I was almost in tears, screaming and shouting. And my boss rang me and she said, um, she said, that's it. Forget it. We're done with this. You know, we can't have this happening. You know, we're done with this, you know nonsense about all this computer-based testing i don't know why you didn't leave it alone you know and then 10 minutes later i got a call from the head of it and he said don't worry about it teresa don't worry there is no way the institute is going to come back and tell the world that technology beat it we are going to proudly say that with technology there is always some experimentation and therefore just keep going, but try not for it to happen again. Um, yes, we had problems with firewalls. Um, we had issues with integration, you know, the, the, the systems talking to each other. Um, we also had an amazing issue. Um, I, I should tell you about it. It's quite funny. So um, one of our centre heads rang up and he said, um, you didn't tell me that every student would get a different so a, a different version of the exam on multiple choice that they would all get different questions why didn't you tell us and i said well i didn't need to tell you because actually any one student will answer the questions that appear in front of them on the exam paper but actually it's a security measure in an uh, it, it is that you know if you're if you're in um in an exam doing multiple choice you know you sort of say well question five c you know um so what we were doing was actually um using shuffling and randomization so your question five was another person's question 17 and their c was your a but what i worked out from that was ah now i know why you're asking this gentleman had actually asked all his students please copy down question question you copy down question one you copy down question two going around the class so that he would eventually be able to recreate his question bank by getting his students to write down questions and thereby um, always have the highest scores um, and be the award-winning centre. Well, we caught him. Of course, we couldn't prove it, but we caught him because, of course, all these students came back with, here's question 15. Well, how come question 15 is the same as question 7? And at that point, he rang up and we realised what he was doing. So, um, uh, we also have the challenges of um, replicating um, test taker behaviour in terms of what the, the, the students feeling uncomfortable if they didn't have their rough paper, if they didn't have their under, facility to underline. So we built all that in very positively, listening to our students and then actually realised a lot of the time they weren't using it as what we thought they needed. So um, my verdict was that um, CBT was a happy um, new beginning and that CBT won the day and that the um, old paper-based exam was relegated to comedy history. So, um, dear, dear, dear audience, um, I could stop now if, it's, if there are any questions you would like on my case study. Um, or I can also carry on to have a look at some, um, the next part of my talk is more about the wider implications. Are there any questions? I would be delighted to answer. Yes, Teresa, there, there's actually a question in the question and answer session. I will read it for you. Uh, Teresa, what is the internet coverage of the UK and how can developing countries 
with low internet coverage adopt your strategy for assessment, in particular examinations. Yeah. And I also would like to tell you that the participants are saying that they love your story. Oh, thank you so much. It's a true story. It's a true story. Look, um, that's a super question. And I will be covering it um, in the second part because um, yeah, and so I'm really pleased to hear that question because, of course, what I've been careful to tell you is this was a fairly um, affluent, you know, this is an affluent um, uh, these are company directors, you know, these are people on six figures. Um, but uh, and that potentially while we had pen and paper, we had a great equalizer which of course we're sitting in an exam hall is completely suitable for 17, 18 year old students. I felt it was undignified for company directors. So that was actually my impetus, but moving on, and I will tell you a little bit more later. Um, I have some colleagues that I am working with in parts of India. So a big clap for some Indian technology where they have completely appreciated this area, not just India, there's many other places, but they have appreciated that there is, and, and, and worked on um, the capability to offer computer-based assessment offline using tablets, where no connectivity is um, available. And um, I'm very happy to connect anybody on a non-commercial basis with these lovely people because um, it certainly aligns with my belief that, you know, we, we should be working to, you know, technologically enabling even our poorer communities. And this very much does it. The one downside I get to hear is that those tablets end up on the, in the local market about a week later. But we've heard the same criticism, even in the UK, where over the pandemic, students have been given tablets and the next day they're for sale in the you know in the secondhand shops so it's a sort of unavoidable but thank you so much for the question and I will answer it a little bit more as I go on shall I go back to my is there anything else shall I Please go back go to my yeah okay right so at the moment I've got your lovely face on my screen do you need to take back shall I take back my screen again You need to share, use the no, share. I'm back. Yep, I'm back onto it. It's back coming. It. Yep, yep. Good. So let's move on then. So I'm going to now fast forward four years. Um, and naturally, the debate goes on. We have, of course, seen over those four years, because my story, um, once upon a time, actually it was only 2016, uh, we do have a lot wider adoption of technology, the advances in technology, including the um, iPad enablement for um, where, where there is a, where, where internet connectivity is, is not an option. We have more experience and certainly it's much more mainstream to be talking about computer-based assessment um, and even remote invigilation. And certainly um, what um, was relatively easy for me four years ago in terms of finding a provider has been um, is now there is a plethora of different providers who will all give you these amazing demonstrations of 150 things that you don't want or you didn't think you want uh, or you wanted. Um, and it's just become somewhat more of a, a complicated mainstream market. But um, I noticed from the agenda that very many of you began with COVID. So I'm sure you were wondering, sooner or later, she's going to get to COVID. Well, there you are. So I've got a new beginning. And here's your, here's the COVID bit. Um, so look, um, so we've got the four years in between what I did. And then all of a sudden, COVID comes and hits us. Um, and we see that what was a smart and modern approach suddenly becomes literally if that's not a contradiction in terms, 
a virtual necessity. So out there, the early adopters are thriving, literally laughing all the way to the bank or smiling smugly that they have managed to, you know, business as usual for them. Um, the in-process adopters have managed to accelerate. So um, my, my, um, my, my um, congratulations, for example, to the, um, the ACCA, who were in the process of rolling out ACCA across various geographical areas and promptly hit the accelerate button and pulled it, pushed it out um, much, much, much more widely. Meanwhile, others found ways of adapting, using cameras, remote interviews. The shock and horror of the UK cancelling for the first time, I think, ever its A-level and GCSE provision. And then our off-call, our regulator, virtually crashing and burning, where we find, you know, I'm sorry if anybody's from off course listening, but I mean, you must have heard it before. Um, look, uh, it certainly didn't give our regulator any um, big, you know, credibility when the algorithm just, you know, crashed and burned. Um, and awarding bodies now are hastily switching from exam to assignment. Not always wisely. Um, I happen to have a look. I work as an external examiner. I happen to look at some question papers destined for parts of Africa, where um, what had simply happened is the exam question was just given as an assignment question. I mean, the poor students are virtually being invited to plagiarise. You know, we all know that there is a reason for an examination, and that is perhaps because you want to um, see what students can do in a limited amount of time. You want to see what students can do um, from, from what they have actually learnt. You want to see how they can apply what they know in a fairly, uh, you know, time constrained environment. That's not an assignment. So, you know, we had, we had some real inappropriate assessment going on. You know, please describe Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Great in an exam. What are you going to do in an assignment except copy? Yeah. So suddenly, computer based assessment has become the new home delivered sliced bread. There we are. You know, happy days if you are a provider of computer based assessment. You can barely get a call into them. So, the COVID catalyst is it progress or what? So, on the 2nd of December, that's just a couple of days ago, um, the UK have announced, actually not the UK, England, has announced that GC exams, GCSE exams will still be paper based. Only a ad adaptation is the syllabus will be shortened and the topics will be pre-announced. Um, any move towards, well, these are 16 and 18 year old young people who probably, if they um, finish their, when they finish their last examination, and if they do not proceed, you know, if they finish their last examination, that is probably the last time they will ever do a handwritten exam at the age of 16 to 18, because most universities are primarily giving assignment based typing based exams so you know we're 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 really holding back these digitally digitally agile kids by insisting that they all sit together with masks on perhaps in examination halls in may of this year um scribbling away at their exams uh, you know I, I i feel disappointed i feel disappointed um but there will be no doubt reasons for that so, you know, where are we now? Well, up to 25% of UK school kids don't have access to technology. So I enjoyed the question earlier because actually, you know, it's everywhere. Um, where we do, what we find is that most of us have got 
you know, these lovely little things, the smartphones, we've got our tablets, um, most are the most widely used technology. But I don't know if you've actually tried to do a multiple choice question paper um, on, on, on your iPad. Uh, it's, it's doable. If you try to do it on your smartphone, um, well, it wrecks your eyesight. It's, 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 it's doable. And that not all kids are used to working on screen. Keyword working. Oh my goodness, they're used to doing things on screen but not necessarily working on screen. So, you know, the current barriers and challenges in the, more broadly, uh, kids are competent button pushers, but they're not always confident typists. Um, you know, what have we got? We're, we're in danger of replacing the scratching of pencil sharpness with um, the clacking of the keyboard. And there will be detractors who will say, well, where's the attraction? You know, clacking of keyboard versus scratching of pencil sharpeners. Is it any different? Um, the students like, um, they like to scribble their notes on paper. Um, how do we replicate that when they can't have paper in a, you know, or how do we provide for that with remote invigilation? What well, we do, we do. Um, and lots of us still resist reading on screen. Now, uh, you know, that old one about, um, well, Kindle's lovely, isn't it? But I still like a nice book in my hands. Well, you know, open book exams in exams. Okay, fine. And on, um, you know, how much can you get on, you know, on screen when you want students to have access to materials? So these are challenges, I think not necessarily barriers. Even small comments like um, paper tests often give you an answer booklet and in the answer booklet you can see how much you need to write. But it's confusing when I see these on-screen text boxes because they just keep expanding and when I think I've written enough it, the box just keeps growing. So am I writing enough? Now it's just one example, and it's ever so easy. You just just fix the box. But um, you know, there's all sorts of you know these barriers that come up. Um, but hey, let's be positive. Let's think positive. Let's be positive. Yeah, you know, this is the UK calling you. Um, you know, uh, so you know we've got our vaccine. Time to be positive, isn't it, dear people? So, um. The good thing is, when I have sat in um, group marking sessions, um, I've had all my examiners sitting around for standardization meetings where we did them face to face. We can also do them remotely. And we say to the examiners, would you like to mark the handwritten examinations or would you like to mark the computer based examinations? I think you can guess which one they all go for. I've even seen examiners sneaking when I, they didn't think I was looking. They've pulled a script out of the pile of scripts. They've opened it up. Ugh. It's that one with the terrible handwriting. And when they thought I wasn't looking, sneaked it back into the bottom of the pile. So I know that markers prefer doing um doing uh, assess, uh, do, doing hand uh, prefer doing typed um typed exams um I'm, I'm actually quite interested in looking at where you have a comparability i think there is actually honestly a halo effect that the impression that a marker gets when they see a beautifully organized and laid out um typed examination script is they've automatically gone into the B zone. Whereas when they look at the disgustingly handwritten, blobby old, scratched out, messy, please to, please look at page 16 before you read page nine type of, you know, annotated script, they've probably gone down into the C range already, you know. So things we need to look, look out for. We've noticed that test takers tend to produce more on 
um, on TypeScript, tend to, not always, um, but certainly their answers are much more coherent because, of course, the tools are, are there. And there's a whole new, the, the, the other thing is that when you're doing a paper-based, you will always be encouraged to make a plan. Actually, you don't need to plan that much quite in the same way because you just type away um, and add bits where you need to. And of course, the fabulous data that emerges that I didn't know I couldn't have, it was there until I discovered it. On remote invigilation, well, um, I personally think that in a situation where your invigilator can see the color of your eyes, literally, that it is a far more secure environment. Um, you definitely have the feeling of being absolutely watched. And the other thing is you can't glance around the room and wait for the invigilators back to be turned because they can see you, you can't see them. But on the other hand, um, what is now emerging is a solid debate around uh, security and around intrusion and around particularly record and review uh, of anything that is recorded because that's you sitting there recorded for three hours. You know, I think there are, you know, and I think we, we, we have to listen very carefully. My understanding is there are currently ongoing um, and, uh, court cases relating to um, abuse of um of of um, re re record of remotely recorded examinations, but you know we are where we are. So um, equality. Well, of course, when we all sat in exam halls, we did have equality. Um, and I guess one of the unfortunate things is this amazing digitalization is beginning to highlight inequality, um, and that is where I'm firmly, firmly wanting to work with those technological providers who really will bridge that gap so that we don't end up with yet another technology is for the haves. And if you happen to be, you know, the brightest kid in the, the brightest bulb in the box in the poorest village in wherever you are, at a different disadvantage. So as I said, I'm working closely with some um, Indian providers who are looking at exactly solving those problems through um, tablet technology and offline examination, and indeed offline learning, it's the same principle. Um, because um, in the immortal words of um, somebody that probably most of you know, um, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world and let us equalize it. So on that note, thank you very much, dear listeners. Um, technology and education are powerful allies. Um, I retain my passion. Um, I retain my, 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 my belief um, that we should be moving towards technology, which of course um, I would hardly be attending this event if I didn't. And I would welcome in the few remaining minutes, any questions you may have. No, no, I just want to say uh, a special thanks to Teresa um, because she has been instrumental in getting association for this conference with the e-assessment foundation. So thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you for the association this year. And we hope that we will still have you in 2021 uh, to join us and, and possibly even have the, associ the association with the e-assessment association. Yes, so, certainly, so certainly. That, you know, Very happy. Positive comments and, this conference. So we hope to build on it to make it better next year and bigger. And my congratulations to all of you for making this happen. You know, it's not easy. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Teresa. Your presentation was very, very, very stimulating.